This meeting is being recorded. Hello and welcome everyone to day seven of the 70, 77th annual CARCD conference. Uh, if you could just take a sec right now and see if your name is listed as unknown and take some time to rename yourself to just your name and your organization. Um, and our topic today in the Ag and Watershed track is very relevant. It's the Flood Mar Building Situational Awareness and now I'll hand it off to your host for today, Marissa Perez-Reyes. Hi, everybody. My name is Marissa Perez-Reyes. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen momentarily. Here we go. And um, can I just get a thumbs up that that's coming up? All right. Great. Um, all right, well, so, I am, uh, as mentioned, my name is Marisa. I um, am a consultant at Stantec. I work to support the function of the Flood Managed Aquifer Recharge Network, FloodMar, uh, which you'll be hearing a lot more about today. Uh, on behalf of all the speakers, I just want to thank CARCD for having us. Um, me and a handful of others uh, from this group came to your in-person event in Folsom last December, and Hannah Tukowski invited us back to come uh, for more, share a bit of a deeper dive on FloodMar. So um, the development of this agenda was a highly collaborative effort. I just also want to give a shout out to Jenny Marr from DWR, as well as um, Asia Massel and Rogel Rogers from Sustainable Conservation for your support in coming up with an event outline and identifying an excellent suite of speakers for you today. So without further ado, I'm going to get us started here uh, with a quick overview of what Floodmar is, what our agenda will be, and then uh, we'll turn you over to the breakout rooms for a quick warm-up exercise. So what is Floodmar? Floodmar is the practice of using high volume flood flows to recharge depleted groundwater basins and um, restore ecosystem and floodplain benefits uh, to riverine or groundwater dependent ecosystems. So um, it sounds like a simple process, but there's so much that needs to happen in tandem uh, from coordination with the flood control system to navigating permits, identifying areas for recharge, and then uh, making sure it all carries out safely. So we have just, there's a lot to dig into here. Um, and that's just a brief little thing to pique your interest. But uh, the agenda for today, we're going to do a breakout group activity. And then um, we will uh, start off with a series of presentations on both the high level and local reasons that uh, managers might choose to pursue recharge of floodwaters. Uh, then Rogel is going to introduce us to a panel of growers who agreed to share with us their experiences in preparing agricultural lands for recharge. We'll have a quick break and then Asia will move us into a discussion on multi-benefit innovations, which range from land repurposing, ecosystem restoration, and recharge for community benefits. Uh, lastly, we'll hear from Arit Kalman at CSU about um, how you can stay engaged with the Floodmar Network community. So I'm going to ask Aaron, our tech host, to launch this quick poll. Um, go ahead and please respond to these three questions. I'll give you a minute. Give it about 30 more seconds. All right, and 
the poll results. Um, Aaron, is everybody able to see this on their screen or should I read this out loud? Okay. Yes. <laughs> All right. So as we can see, we have uh, some good distribution. A uh, few more people here from the San Joaquin Valley in Southern California than from the coastal or Sacramento Valley, Northern California regions, but still good spread. Um, and in terms of experience level with recharge, um, we have about 30% of people are doing recharge. Uh, about 25% have explored the recharge opportunities. Um, a few don't think it will work for them. And um, a lot of folks, about 40%, uh, don't know enough about recharge. And I hope that we'll be able to answer some of your questions today. So um, that's great. Thank you for submitting those poll responses. Okay, and so we've got about 28 of you on the line. Um, what we'd like to do next is send you out to uh, breakout groups for 15 minutes to discuss this question, which we hope will really frame up the rest of today. Um, the question is, what is important for you to know or understand in order to recharge? And uh, really the, the goal in this question is, to get us thinking about uh, what, what information do you need? What do you need more information about? For all of you folks who said, I don't know enough about it, uh, but maybe you're interested, what, what do you need and what do you wanna get out of this session? And um, so this is really your time and we really hope that um, you'll be able to uh, maybe unmute yourselves, maybe come off camera and introduce who you are. I still see that a lot of you have come in. Um, with the name unknown. If you wanna go ahead and take a minute um, as Emily suggested and rename yourself, um, that would be really helpful and um, always easier to talk to some faces. Um, so this is really your time and um, I hope that you'll make the most of it. But when you come back, uh, be prepared to share some highlights from what you hear um, and get ready to really get into the topic. Um, Erin, are you feeling ready to send us out. Yep, I will open the rooms now.
All right, Aaron, have we, um, do we have critical mass back in the room here? Yes, you do. All right, fantastic. Welcome back from your breakout sessions. Uh, I guess I want to hear from you. Uh, how was that? Uh, did you get a chance to meet some other folks at the conference today and um, maybe share what's an important thing that you heard from somebody else in your room? Do we have any takers? I'll, I'll go ahead and say for my room, it's this is just reminds me what's so important about conference sessions is to hear what other folks are doing, what they're struggling with and what is working for them. It's very helpful. Thanks, Dr. Williams. What's one of those things that you heard, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, I heard it uh, uh, last week too, but the challenges with navigating paperwork and and how how important uh, organization like uh, our resource conservation districts can be in helping farmers get through that paperwork. That's great. Genevieve, I saw you come off mute. Yeah, um, we had a really fun conversation. Um, and I think there's actually a couple of things that came up. One was there's this context of going from drought to flood and kind of the, the suddenness and the challenge of that. And I think people are thinking about recharge as maybe, you know, a, a way to kind of work with that a little bit more. Um, there was definitely some questions around how how do we do recharge in the context of water rights? Is there a simplified way to explain it and understand it? Um, but also, how do we do recharge with water rights, kind of um, making sure that we're respecting water rights? Um, and there's a question around what role might RCDs play, both in bringing in the variety of stakeholders as well as providing technical assistance around recharge. Um, and we had a couple of Central Coast RCDs in our group who were thinking about what does it look like on the Central Coast, whether that's reconnecting floodplains or at, you know groundwater ba recharge bases versus active farmland, and then also active farmland and how it um, coincides with food safety issues. So uh, we may not get into some of those nuances here, but for the organizers, that's a really interesting kind of set of questions that I think are helpful for many, but focused on the Central Coast for sure. All right, and I think we have time for one more quick one um, before we move into our first session. Marisa, I will offer. Um, although I was in the same group as Dr. Williams, um, but a couple of the folks who joined our conversation touched on the importance of developing partnerships and then thinking about um, managed aquifer recharge in a holistic fashion. And then similar um, to what we were just speaking about, kind of figuring out how to navigate the important conversations surrounding water rights and um, what am I doing? What is my neighbor doing? How do we go about this in a collaborative fashion? And then um, we, we did touch a little bit on the mechanics of it, meaning um, like how, how do you go about selecting soil profiles, for example, that would support um, aquifer recharge and some budding new technologies to enable those types of decisions. Thanks, Megan. All really good questions. And um, I'm excited to hear that the things that are on people's minds are uh, going to be touched on in, in today's session. So um, some through this uh, presentation coming up next and others uh, later in the conversation. Um, so um, I'm really glad to hear some of that resonating. Um, and before I take up any more time, I am going to introduce uh, the next session. We have uh, Deciding to Recharge 
Um, this is essentially all the nuts and bolts of what you need to know uh, from a high level in terms of kind of what what are what are the high level benefits of recharge and then really getting into the specifics. Um, Daniel Mountjoy uh, with Sustainable Conservation has worked in so many different areas of the state uh, to get these recharge projects in the ground. And uh, Jenny Marr with the California Department of Water Resources is um, the flood mar expert over there and has uh, been knee deep in the water rights conversations. And so she has some uh, some tips to share with us. Um, and then lastly, Aaron Fercuda from the Tulare Irrigation District is going to uh, share some words of wisdom about um, what it means to scale it down to the, the district level. So Daniel, I'm going to let you take it away. Myself off mute and share screen with you all. And this slideshow going. So you, can you see the slides there? We can see the, the whole screen, yeah. Um, and then so maybe, see. there yep. we go, great. So I just wanted to start with, you know, why recharge? Um, one of the things that we realize is people come to this with a lot of different reasons for why they might be doing recharge. And um, from landowners perspective that RCDs work with, um, probably the main, reason for recharge is typically focused on replenishing the groundwater supply and ensuring uh, water resilience and water security um, during droughts, drought years. Um, you know, that's clearly um, a motivation and many of the volunteer pilot projects that you'll hear about um, from in the later sessions are, are farmers that are doing this just because um, they, they, they want that water and they see the benefit of replenishing the water um, under their farms. But of course, the other big sort of legal requirement that the many areas of the state are facing is um, the SIGMA, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act compliance, and addressing these um, six undesirable results um, shown here on the slide um, that are causing significant problems, not just for individual landowners, but for the entire basin or parts of the basin, maybe not underneath the farmer um, who wants the water um, for their water reliability. And then we like to think about this also in, in a bigger context that um, I think the RCDs are well suited for, which is the multiple resource benefits that can come out of doing recharge. Um, sort of the obvious first one around the water supply, but we might, um, from an agricultural perspective, think of it think of it as ag water reliability. But really, in so many of our communities, it's drinking water for um, the public and uh, domestic wells in rural communities and especially disadvantaged communities that are being adversely impacted by increased groundwater depletion. And then um, as was brought up um, in some of the early breakout group discussions, how can recharge also enhance floodplain and wetland habitat and provide better environmental flows in our streams and rivers? And then of course, what we're really all aware of right now is the flood risk reduction and how could diverting more water help with mitigating some of these disastrous events like we're seeing now. Um, somebody mentioned um, needing to know where the right sites are to do recharge. And there's a lot of variable uh, variability across the state. And I'm just putting up here two resources um, that can use be used to identify um, is your site suitable. Um, and what you can see from these maps, first the sustainable or the soil agricultural groundwater banking index developed at UC Davis, which really takes the, the NRCS soil surveys and looks at the suitability of that top six feet for um, infiltrating water through it. And you see in the, the, the lighter green areas, really highly suitable areas, and in the reds, much less feasible, but in fact, very poor for recharge. And so depending on where you are in these agricultural regions, um, some areas are better suited than others. And then Land IQ took this a step further in partnership with the Almond Board and integrated into this the underlying geology and depth to groundwater to understand if you did do recharge there, is there volume and space to put that water, which further accentuates some of these unsuitable areas um, in the low-lying portions of the valleys where there's clays, but also shallow groundwater, and accentuates the areas where there's sandy soils and well-suited um, conditions for recharge. So those are just two resources. Um, you can drill in and look at individual fields on either of these maps. And then again, back to the idea of, of um, differences across the state. 
Um, a lot of what you're seeing more in the media right now is on the lower right-hand side, um, these images of what sometimes is referred to as AGMAR, um, Agricultural Managed Aquifer Recharge or On-Farm Recharge, which is very typical um, in many of the pilots and what you'll hear about today in the San Joaquin and Tulare basins, um, again, where there's well-suited soils and dispersed broad areas can be recharged amongst compatible um, crops. But that may not be as suitable in other regions. And on the Central Coast, um, the RCD of Santa Cruz County has been working closely with the Potter Valley Water Management Agency to identify very specific locations where recharge basins can be constructed at the base of the hills where there are good porous soils, um, unlike out in the, in the farmland valley bottoms. And um, these targeted locations um, capture surface water runoff because on the Central Coast, there are no irrigation district canal systems to move that water um, across a much broader dispersed um, ag landscape. And then up in the um, Sacramento Valley, again, a, a variations we're learning about up in that region where there are canals, um, but the um, soils are oftentimes uh, tight and not as well suited for recharge. And the growers don't necessarily wanna um, give up their, or take risks on those soils with increasing uh, water logging, and instead are more interested in using ditches and drainage swales and old gravel pits and burrow pits um, on those lands that they have and that water can be dumped into and allowed to infiltrate in those locations. So each region has um, kind of different unique ways um, given their soils, given the crops that are being grown, and given the, the groundwater conditions in each area. And I did want to just talk a little bit more about recharge methods. Um, as we were just talking about, active farmland um, is, is one um, opportunity. And this is true for crops like grapes um, and almonds and pistachios and walnuts. The perennial um, uh, woody crops can handle that kind of uh, recharge as well as alfalfa. But it, um, many of the row crops really can't handle being inundated during the growing season. So fallow lands, and having winter fallow fields available is a critical land use um, to increase our potential to grab some of these big flood events and put a lot of water on the land in a very short period of time. And you'll hear more about that from Aaron pretty shortly. Um, recharge basins, as I mentioned on the Central Coast, is a, you know, a common strategy, as well as out in other farmlands where crops are not compatible. Um, and recharge basins provided the added benefit of being able to put a lot of water at once in a small area, and they also provide um, less risk for transporting agricultural, historic agricultural chemicals and nutrients into the groundwater because a lot of water keeps getting applied in the same place and thereby adding to dilution of any historic um, uh, accumulations. And then another idea that's, that's gaining some prominence is subsurface drains, um, putting in essentially uh, tile drains, but rather than having them drain the land, water is put in from the top and um, infiltrates below the root zone. And this can be used in areas where there's a heavy uh, clay soil in the top of the surface, but sandier soils below. It also avoids the risk of any um, root problems for the crop and puts the water, the fresh water down below the uh, fertilization uh, region of the, of the crop. So these are all possible options, as well as um, some lands that are adjacent to fields that are not being cropped um, that could be more of habitat type uh, recharge. And then I wanted to talk briefly about incentives because um, this is another big question that comes up with farmers is, you know, why should I do this? Um, I might have the right soils, but doesn't everybody benefit from me doing the recharge? And there's um, a number of strategies that um, Joe Chaparena on our team has been interviewing folks around the state um, irrigation districts and GSAs to find out how they are incentivizing. And there's a couple of different strategies. Um, one lies with the price of water um, that's being used for recharge. And some districts are offering that water for free. Others are offering it at a reduced cost um, to, to encourage growers to take these excess waters when it's available and put it um, on their lands for the benefit of the, of the basin. Um, another set of cat category of incentives is around direct payments, either um, following leases or um, permanent easement leases or easements for um, recharge locations to encourage people to not plant 
um, and have lands available when water does become available. Um, those can be um, you know, very typical easement type programs or annual type leases. And then cost share programs like NRCS is now offering as a pilot in several locations. Um, and then some other districts are offering directly for the costs, offset the cost of installation of infrastructure, as well as just paying for the, the work of um, setting up a field for, for recharge. And then there's an, another set of strategies that are really emerging right now with the GSAs and the irrigation districts, and that farmers are quite interested in involving pumping credit in future years um, for the groundwater that they apply through recharge, being able to pump that back out again, as well as um, credit towards surface water when it's available, um, that those farmers get more surface water or get a discount on their water bill for that surface water they use um, in uh, wet years. So all of these are creating important incentives for growers. The water rights question is the next big piece. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jenny to cover that. And Jenny, do you want me to um, advance your slides or do you wanna turn on and share yours? Yeah, Daniel, if you've got my slide deck in, um, that'd be great if you would advance it. Sure. Well, thanks. Um, good morning, everybody. Again, my name is Jenny Marr. I'm with the Department of Water Resources and our Flood Mar program. And I'd like to say, contrary to my last name, I have more experience in flood management than I do in managed aquifer recharge. So I'll spend a few minutes today um, talking about the flood in, in flood mar. So um, just for some level setting, you know, this year is exceptional in the amount of water that we're getting. Um, we're tracking some of the wettest years on record in terms of precipitation and snowpack, um, you know, in, in late December, early January, we had a series of nine atmospheric rivers and in very quick succession. And I, I think when us flood mar implementers were envisioning um, flood mar in winter season, you know, we were thinking uh, a moderate atmospheric river every two weeks or so over a three, four month period where we could wet up and dry out. And, you know, this year was definitely, uh, you know, looking at flood mar from the perspective of, of extremes. And we're really in a, you know, public health and safety mode in dealing with the kind of precipitation um, we've gotten this year. So typically this type of year, we would manage for flood risk reduction primarily. And in the past, that has meant removing water from the system as quickly as possible. Um, but right now, there's a significant amount of interest in maximizing the potential benefits of flood events while minimizing the negative impacts. And, and that primarily means spreading water out and slowing it down. A, a big part of this interest, of course, is using floodwaters to maximize recharge to replenish overdrafted groundwater basins. Um, in a year like this, recharge will occur in uncontrolled via flooding and controlled ways. And we definitely want to maximize recharge in a controlled manner as much as possible. Um, it's worth noting that if you're diverting water solely to reduce a flood risk, you do not need a water right. A state water resources control board fact sheet says that control of floodwaters to prevent nearby flooding does not require a water right in these cases because water is diverted to avoid a hazard and not to achieve a beneficial use. Um, so that's very important to note when you're operating in a flood response mode. Um, but if you want to divert water to reduce a flood risk and take action to maximize groundwater recharge, um, you need a water right to protect that water for your beneficial use later. Next slide. So many people ask that if we're dealing with such high flows, why are water rights so challenging to obtain? Um, in reality, we're in a queue that's 100 years in the making. Um, we're divvying up a limited and precious resource. And unfortunately, in 2023, we're at the back of the line. And it's the less reliable and less frequent high flows that are left. Um, DWR has been providing technical assistance to local agencies uh, interested in implementing pilot projects using high flows for recharge. And, and we have seen the same things that you know, we've heard for a long time. 
that water rights are complicated. Uh, the process is resource intensive. It's time consuming to, 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 to develop applications. But in reality, um, you know, the water rights are also protective of finite resource. They're protective of legal water users and the environment. So when you have a water right, you're kind of thankful for it being complicated and, and, and really needs to be well thought out and, and take time to apply for. But when you want a new water right, these challenges can seem daunting. Uh, but there are newer pathways to help the process become a little easier, a little less resource intensive and a little less time consuming. Um, next slide. So the water board um, and the state do have streamlined and simplified pathways for water right. Um, I stress right now um, in red font and underlined in bold that last week um, the governor released an executive order that uh, makes using current floodwaters for groundwater um, recharge and being able to maximize that recharge to the extent possible, uh, this executive order makes that a little bit easier. So this executive order basically says between March 10th and June 1st of this year, diversion of flood water can occur under some you know, specific conditions. There's an imminent risk of flood and we're only going to divert water during this imminent risk of flood condition when there's no longer flood risk, diversions will stop. Um, the diversions can use existing infrastructure or temporary pumps that are fitted with uh, simple fish screens. Um, the uh, recharge lands can include existing working landscapes, um, uh, agricultural land, uh, recharge basin, fallow fields. Um, really what this EO does is um, allows people to make these types of diversions without a water right. And it also provides some regulatory relief by way of um, uh, CEQA exemptions and lake and stream bed alteration program um, exemptions. So there's a couple um, restrictions in um, how you can apply or, or how you can comply with the EO requirements. And that is, uh, you know, no permanent construction uh, or no construction as part of um, the diversions for this EO. Um, you cannot divert water onto dairy land application areas or agricultural fields where pesticides and fertilizers have been applied in the last 30 days. And there are some additional reporting requirements to the GSA and the State Water Board if you do make diversions under this executive order. Um, for me, what was significant about the executive order is that now you can take intentional action to maximize groundwater recharge without a water right. Um, without this EO in place, these actions would require a water right. Um, next slide. So when you do have to get a water right, um, there are some other streamlined and simplified pathways. Um, the water board has started using 180 day and five year temporary permits, which um, include a faster processing time, um, you know, some um, ability to issue permits, um, you know, during the notification project. So permits can get issued sooner um, for that 180 day temporary permit process. Um, there's also what's called a streamlined pathway for local agencies that are specifically using high flows for groundwater recharge. Um, as part of that, there are simplified water availability analysis. Uh, there are simplified accounting processes. Um, you can do an umbrella, umbrella permit. So multiple diverters, multiple points of diversion um, can get together at a GSA, a basin, a district scale and do a single umbrella permit. There are reduced filing fees um, for, uh, for filing the application and reduced annual fees for water that may be diverted. Uh, there's CEQA exemption under the current executive order um, for flood recharge and the drought executive order that should be uh, you know, around for a while yet. And there's also state technical and regulatory assistance as part of the governor's water supply strategy that's available to local agencies that are interested in pursuing temporary permits for uh, uh, projects that use high flow for groundwater recharge. 
Um, my last slide, Daniel, if you don't mind. Um, I know this was quick. Um, and they asked me to talk about water rights. I think I had a 50 slide <laughs> slide deck and boiled it down to um, five to get down to a five minute presentation. Um, but these are links that I find helpful. And if the slide deck is shared, these are all live links to these websites. Um, first and foremost, if you have questions, please feel free to reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to provide some direction and um, folks to talk to, websites to look at. Otherwise, um, you know, here are some really good references. And I'll turn it back to Daniel. Great. Thank you, Jenny. Um, so we've talked about the, the condition, the soil conditions, the recharge methods. We've talked about the water rights. Um, wanted to give you now um, an example of what is the recharge potential? If we were to actually um, have in place systems to take all this water, what would that actually look like? And DWR um, has led a, a flood mar study of the Merced River watershed to, to look at that. And I wanted to just give you a sense of some of the results of this. And the, the question that this um, study was looking at is, with future climate change um, and water availability, what we refer to as water available for recharge or wafer, how can that those future water flows um, projected over the next hundred years be allocated across potential recharge sites? And this is it, if all those water rights were in place, we were protecting environmental flows in the streams and in the delta, how much recharge could be achieved and where? And one of the key messages out of this approach is, is that on-farm flood mar um, really has to consider a number of different factors. The daily availability of the water, um, the diversion and conveyance capacity, and again, we're this is using a, a Central Valley example where you've got canals and um, reservoirs to, that can be operated to divert this water. The um, hydrogeologic suitability of the site as shown in those maps earlier, and the crops compatibility or the existence of fallow fields. And um, we, we do this through a variety of different tools um, that DWR are, operates around reservoirs and ru uh, runoff and flood analysis. And then the groundwater recharge assessment tool that we've developed at Sustainable Conservation helps evaluate all the on-farm uh, conditions uh, to ass assess where this water can go. And real quickly, in terms of the results of this study, some of the really interesting findings are that um, just filling up irrigation district canals, in this case, in the Merced Irrigation District, um, every time water is available, can, contributes to 47% of the total recharge under current climate conditions. Um, adding on-farm recharge doubles that. Right now, many irrigation districts have their canals dry during the winter months um, for maintenance. So districts have achieved significant success simply turn, opening those canals up. So that's a, that's a bottom line, easy solution. Um, the other thing is, if, we, if those districts just use their existing conveyance and on-farm recharge, they can offset about 31% of the average annual overdraft of their groundwater system. But if you add to that reservoir reoperation, which is managing reservoirs to release water in anticipation of upcoming floods so that that water that's released can be captured downstream in a more metered out managed flow, um, farmland can, be, can then capture up to 46% of the overdraft um, offset over up to 46%. And then if we start to look at conveyance expansion, um, larger canals um, where, where there's tight spots, looking at floodplains and site stream side um, basins or, or um, floodplain expansion, um, this can move up to 63% of the of overdraft can be addressed in the Merced example. And importantly, from the flood side of flood mar, um, anticipated climate change flood flows are likely to increase sixfold in the Merced area, but they can then be reduced back down by 65% by managing these systems in an effective manner so that that water isn't all of a sudden suddenly released, but in fact is used on, taken off and used and put in the groundwater. So just some sense of scale of what this approach can do. And then the final concept here is, can we target recharge for some of those broader goals? Um, if we're simply focused on in-basin retention, keeping the water in the groundwater basin, the best fields in the Merced case are right in the middle of the district where it doesn't flow out to the other surrounding areas. But if the goal is community drinking water, for instance, we can target water recharge to fields in it adjacent to communities where drinking water wells shown in black are at risk of going dry, 
within these red disadvantaged community areas. So when there's only a little bit of water available in a, in a given year, recharging those fields would be most important for the community benefits. And if you have more water, you can place it on additional fields. And then third um, approach is if our goal is really ecosystem benefits, such as shorebird habitat during migratory season or groundwater dependent ecosystems, or even trying to improve the flows in the streams during drought years, it's a different set of fields that really are best suited for putting the water on those because they're gonna release it for those environmental beneficial uses. So thinking about different strategies for targeting recharge for different outcomes is an important part of the communication process and sometimes involves trade-offs, um, but can achieve these uh, multiple objectives. And this is really where I think RCDs could come into play and that GSAs are gonna to have to be having these conversations as well, that there needs to be more collaboration to pull, to pull together um, these kinds of solutions. So I am gonna stop there and turn it over to Aaron to give us some real world examples. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for uh, inviting me to, to this discussion. And I'm hoping, can everybody see that? Daniel, can you see my? Yeah. Great. So I, I've been asked to kind of talk about some of the things that are happening within our groundwater sustainability agency in our irrigation district, which um, I manage both of those here. Um, this picture here is from uh, earlier this year when we had uh, the nine atmospheric rivers that uh, Jenny was uh, mentioning. We had nine uh, cold um, atmospheric rivers. So we were able to meter that water out. This farmer here, this is a pistachio field, just opened up all his valves and started flooding it uh, for probably about 30 days straight. And I'll explain why he did this and what his part of the uh, equation was. But to give you just kind of a, a landscape or geographic location, we are in the Cahuilla subbasin. We're a 441,000 acre subbasin managed uh, to comply with Sigma. Uh, we are part of the mid Cahuilla, which is partnered with the city of Visalia and city of Tulare. Our irrigation district is within that footprint. Um, we are a 65,000 acre irrigation district, a very old one formed in 1889. Um, uh, Daniel highlighted something very important. You know, we have 300 miles of earthen canals and uh, we've resisted the um, move to line our canal specifically for that recharge. Uh, aspect. And it, it, Daniel's right, it's one of our primary recharge uh, systems. When we fire up during a recharge mode, we basically open up all the, the gates and, and let them percolate. Now that is um, tempered against flood uh, concerns, and you have to leave your system open when you're in flood releases in order to flush that water. If you have it checked up ready for recharge, you could overtop your banks and cause flooding everywhere. We also uh, operate and maintain 1,300 acres of recharge basins. So um, uh, we've been in that business for a long time. Um, and then in order to do that recharge, we've got about 150,000 acre feet that we divert annually through two water supplies, a pre-1914 water right and a CVP front uh, contract on the, from the Bureau of Reclamation. You can see we're built as a conjunctive use irrigation district because our class one supply is 30,000, which is your firm supply, and 141,000 of uh, class two supply, which is wet year water. So today, the Bureau of Reclamation has a 70% uh, class two allocation, which you know we won't even touch 40% of that this year if we're lucky. Um, and there's a good case to be made. There's 100% class two up there and more. Um, we have about 200 growers in our district, and mainly the dairy industry is our greater than 50% of our land area, but we do have a lot of other uh, nut crops out there. Um, and cotton used to be our primary uh, crop, but that is long since uh, passed. Overlying our overall program and where everything started for us and the rest of my discussion here is based upon what we call the water accounting framework. When we established our groundwater sustainability plan, uh, we like to say we went through a, a negotiated adjudication amongst the GSAs, the ma uh, managers and the attorneys and the landowners to say, okay, let's identify who has that water underground. And so this is our quick image of it. There's three buckets. So as water goes into the ground, it's identified by ownership where it belongs. The native belongs to everybody. The foreign supply is that CVP import or water that does not 
source itself in the Kahlua watershed. And then salvaged is for that investment in that water supply, you get credit for it. So by numbers, if you take the mid Kahlua Groundwater Sustainability Agency, we have about 230,000 acre feet um, when we take the averages from 1997 to 2017, um, when you compare that against our average pumping during that period, um, one would say you have a groundwater surplus. We had 38,000 more we're bringing in than we're using. But that didn't comport with our groundwater levels, and our groundwater levels are, were dropping significantly. Uh, we do believe that's external forces. However, uh, our groundwater levels were dro dropping so fast. And in 2021, a group of growers came to me and said, listen, Aaron, uh, it's May and, and, or March, actually, and we, we're starting to see issues in our wells. We're doing well work right now. Um, this well's not going to last me five years. They're half a million dollars a piece, so I'm just farming for wells. All my revenue is going to go into the wells. If we can put something together and that's reasonable, that doesn't take us out of business, but gives us some longevity, uh, count us in. So we sat down and talked about it, but you can imagine as the perspective is when we started this program is, you know, oh great, here comes the irrigation district, here comes again, we're here to help, we're gonna allocate to you, don't worry, we're gonna restrict, we're, gonna, we're going to charge you, and uh, we're gonna charge you for your groundwater, which is theoretically, a, everybody thinks of it as a property right. The way we kind of bridged a lot of that was by collaborating with our growers and making sure that everybody was at the table for that discussion. Um, and instead of it being a program generated by a GSA or an irrigation district, it was a collaborative process. So I had what was called uh, creatively the coffee shop committee because it was those growers that you know are actively communicating with all their neighbors and um, so I gathered them up and, you know, we sat down and we talked about, well, how would you, how would this work for you? How would, what would work? What would we quickly identified? What would not work? Interesting, right off the bat, what we identified will not work is metering all the groundwater wells. That was just logistically not possible. And there were too many problems. We didn't have enough staff to manage it. So we opted for the evapotranspiration model. So land IQ measures all of our evapotranspiration. And I would say I'm an engineer. I advocated for the meters, but I am a firm believer in the, the ET model. It's a quick way you can get to an allocation program and collectively get everybody with you. I also had an advisory committee, and that included not just agriculture, but included environmental community, disadvantaged community, uh, all beneficial users at the table. We, did, we developed this uh, uh, preliminary allocation and groundwater cap elements. And then we moved it into a draft emergency ordinance. Um, and that basically said during the drought, we're gonna have to figure out how to allocate and cut back quickly. So we are taking our emergency ordinance right now and working towards full rules and regulations. But right now we have the emergency um, upper, uh, ordinance in place. We did hold, I, I can't remember how many workshops we held too. It, it was during COVID. So it was interesting that we did this all virtually and, and had, each session, 30, 40 growers participating in each one. So this is how it looks. We, we crammed it into one image so that to, to try and make it as simple as possible. We allocate groundwater based on tiers. Interestingly enough, if you see there's three main tiers down here, eventually we'll transition that into those buckets that we talked about. Um, and then we have two categories, surface water users and groundwater dependent. And there's charges. These $10 charges are really just to kind of cover our administrative costs, but there's a hard cap on evapotranspiration at 2.5 acre feet per acre. That number is a little high. We're starting a little high to get people time to adjust. And I think that was a huge success. We also added a mitigation block on top, which is we're gonna make mistakes. Landowners are gonna make mistakes. We don't wanna punish each other, but if we go over, we know we've gotta replace that molecule of water. So that $260 goes into an account, I can use that account on my irrigation district side to go purchase more surface water on the open market. If you go over into the penalty tier, Sigma only allows you to charge $500 an acre foot as a maximum penalty charge and, or a maximum charge at all. 
the grower self-initiated, when you go into penalty, the money wouldn't stop you, but they self-inflicted. If you go over, you lose what you went over in the future. So if you go over an acre foot per acre, you lose an acre foot per acre off of future allocation. So that has stopped everybody from going over into the penalty. There are some folks that have gone into the mitiga mitigation tier, but that's the, the hammer. Um, and it was self-inflicted by the growers because they knew they needed that hammer. We also developed a water dashboard because if we're going to measure and restrict and they need to know where they're at. So we developed a water dashboard. They can log on, see in 30 day time steps, their evapotranspiration use, uh, how much they're allocated, how much they're using, and then how much their credits they're getting uh, down to the field. So we can go down to the individual field. So wanted to highlight that that was in the, developed to respond to a drought. And what we found was that allocation system, the, the cap and the water dashboard flipped into a tool to use for groundwater recharge. So this has become our incentive tool um, for groundwater recharge. Prior to Sigma, the only recharge agent in our area was TID for our, re for our region, for our GSA, because we did all the recharge in our basins and our canal. Now you'll see when we fired up in early January, we had 80 turnouts on immediately. The day we opened orders, we had 80 turnouts open taking water. They get credit for it on their water dashboard. So now we've got our system plus the fields irrigating whatever's not used through evapotranspiration gets credited on their water dashboard as a groundwater credit that they can pump at a later date. So in January alone, we had 80 turnouts on. We were at 750 cubic feet per second or 1,500 acre feet per day. Pre-Sigma, that number in a January would have been about 300 to 350. So an immense amount of recharge going on. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight is that I was asked to talk about a, a creative program we're working on with the community of Okieville to take our water rights and our knowledge on recharge to help our disadvantaged community. So we uh, purchased a 20 acre site. Um, we just awarded contracts. Uh, we should be done by the spring of next year. And this is a groundwater recharge basin upgrading of a disadvantaged community. Our Sierra snow melt is usually cleaner than the groundwater. And so we're going to put clean water supplies under the community uh, as dedicated recharge for their drinking water concerns. And I'm happy to report we're currently under budget and on schedule on that project. We barely get, we very rarely get to report things like that. So I had to throw it in there. So uh, I appreciate that quick glance at what we're doing and I'm, I'm looking forward to the questions and, and discussion. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks, Jenny. Uh, we have about five minutes left in this session here for questions and answers. And um, if we uh, have more questions than that, um, uh, let's see if we can, um, we, we might be able to circle back a little bit later. But um, we've got quite a few popping in here. Um, uh, the first question uh, was for Jenny, actually, from Wendy regarding the executive order. It also requires reporting of the diversions. Uh, she wanted to know if you could talk about that and particularly um, the potential sensitivity of releasing those reports um, from the grower's perspective. Is there uh, anything briefly that you can share on that? Yeah, so um, the reporting requirement on the EO, you know, asks for some basic information, you know, who's doing the diversion, um, where's the diversion? What are the recharge lands? Um, you know, how much was diverted and, and, and you know, an, an estimate and, you know, when were those diversions taking place? So if there is sensitive information within that request, you know, definitely work with the water board. Like they are, uh, you know, great at, at, at working with, you know, DWR and local agencies to kind of figure out, you know, what can be made public and what can't. Um, alternatively, it, 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 it could be um, possible, I, I imagine, I haven't talked to the water board, but um, they um, have been um, accepting of this in the past, especially under some of these more streamlined pathways of, of rolling up information. So if multiple diverters within the same district 
you know, are using the same trigger and, you know, want to roll up reporting at a district scale, I'd work with your district and maybe do a rolled up report at the district level um, to report on multiple diversions and, and where that happens. So then, you know, individual grower information is kind of, um, for lack of a better term, I'll say washed out by kind of the roll up of, of, of multiple points of diversion. Thanks so much, Jenny. It's really useful. Uh, we have a question from an unknown participant who asks, does the ET method penalize regenerative ag growers? I think that might be for Aaron. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So we do have a, I think when they say regenerative ag growers, is that like cover crops and other things like that? I'm, I'm not a farmer. That's my, that's my downfall. Don't ask me to grow anything. Trust me. If that is the question, then we have a fallow field application. They can get they get credits for their field. The cover crop is not counted against them as the evapotranspiration. In the field, if you're doing cover crops, our agreement with our growers is cover crops use ET. You can't avoid it. However, the benefits come in the soil health, other things like that. So it should be a net, it should be a net neutral uh, action on their part. So um, we're 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 working with that to try and understand that better in the future. But that's our answer as of today. Thanks, Aaron. And we did get confirmation. Yes, that's what they were talking about. So, uh, and there's a question from Wes Miller. Is the future farmer credit at 100% or a reduced credit? Yes, that's the other question we're working with. It is not 100% because not 100% of what you put on the ground ends up in the aquifer. That fraction currently stands at 75%, but we're reevaluating that as we speak. It could be as high as 90 Great. And Andy Williamson asks, I would like to understand how flood managed aquifer recharge is treated by water quality control boards. As I understand it from our irrigated lands compliance group in San Diego, farmers are not allowed to let stormwater soak away and infiltrate groundwater. And I would just Daniel, answer that. Yeah. Yeah, I would answer that by saying that um, we're talking about um, clean um, uh, runoff water from the from uh, rivers as opposed to stormwater runoff from cities. Um, in, in most cases here, and there's a lot of conversations going on with the water boards, um, some new studies being done to try and document, you know, what is the concentration of the, the contaminants when you do add a lot of fresh water? Can you actually improve the conditions? And sustainable conservation does have a, a document out that was developed in partnership with researchers and disadvantaged communities and others to, to help describe some of those trade-offs and what those um, considerations are, but there isn't a, a actual regulation or policy on that at this point. Thanks, Daniel. Other, other than I will say the, the, the dairy lands piece that we're starting to hear about in the EO. That's right. There, there are restrictions um, and, uh, you know, uh, there are restrictions on the applicability of the executive order. Uh, I don't know if Daniel's audio is frozen for anyone else. Um, Oh, there you are. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. No, there you are. Um, yeah, there are restrictions in place on 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 what the executive order will apply to, which it, it also includes um, uh, related to uh, fertilization of the of recent grounds. So um, there are some things in in place of, regarding water quality protections. Um, I'm going to beg forgiveness from our next session and ask this one question from Barbara. Uh, for Aaron, if you set a cap of two and a half acre feet per year, what do farmers uh, do who normally use four acre feet per year? Uh, and what's the process by which the farmers came to agree on that cap? Yeah, Barbara, that's the, right. That's the question that we, you know, we're fearful of, right? So we know they're using more than what we allocated and how are they going to survive? Uh, farmers, I will say in general, are the most resilient people you'll ever meet. And in just sitting down and discussing with them and asking, you know, we can probably sustainably give you two point. Well, actually, the number we we can probably stand on is about two acre feet per acre in groundwater credit. So we're at two point five to start out with. So we gave them a little bit extra. They all acknowledge that the world looks different moving into the future. And for those of farmers that are using more than four acre, you know, two point five, they had to come up with a solution. And what we're seeing on the ground is this groundwater credit program, they can do groundwater recharge on their fields and build credit. Um, they're also talking with their neighbors and saying, well, okay, if I um, lease your ground, I can take your credit and move it over to my field. So by net volume balance, we can we can meet that, that threshold. So 
Overall, I don't know anywhere in the Central Valley that hasn't accepted the fact that there will be a reduction in, in farm output in order to meet the current groundwater supply availability. And we were leaving that to the growers to make the decision on how they need to do it. We are also seeing alfalfa growers adopt new technologies to reduce that four acre feet per acre. Um, however, interestingly, I wanna say our district is an advocate for the most efficient farmer is one that can drip in drought and flood in, flood in wet years like this. If we get to a point where you only have drip, system in, drip systems in your field, we actually cut off that natural return flow from flood irrigation. So we actually have growers that are putting flood systems back in where programs force them to take their drip out. So for our alfalfa guys that were generally flood irrigated, they're now putting in subsurface drip to get down. I don't know, I've heard they can actually get down into that two, three acre foot per acre. All right, thank you, Aaron. Um, and thank you, Daniel and Jenny, once again, for that um, for that session, it was really great. And um, I hope that any remaining questions, I, I think we we addressed everything that I saw come through the chat. And um, I, um, if anyone has additional questions and if uh, the presenters stay online, they can probably um, respond in the chat. But otherwise, thank you so much for your time. Um, I'm going to, uh, invite to the virtual stage, Rogel Rogers, um, who's going to lead us through this next session today. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Joe Chaparana, and Rogel is on our panel. Um, but Got I'm gonna, it. Yeah, no worries. Go for uh, it, Joe. <laughs> yeah, and I just want to check in. I'm hoping we have a panel of Rogel and also three growers, and um, I just want to make sure that Eric, Gerdial, and Karun are on the line today. If you guys can unmute and let me know if you're here. Morning, Jeff. Garden Samron, I'm here. Great, thank you. Hello, Joe. I'm here, and um, I know I have uh, Gerdial on the phone. He's trying to join us now. Had some uh, tech difficulties, but hopefully he'll be joining us momentarily. Okay, well, we can go ahead and get started. Um, once again, my name is Joe Chopper and I'm project director for water resources with sustainable conservation. And we have a really yeah. good uh, agenda today. So I'm just going to kind of keep this moving as quickly as possible. So we have as much time to hear from the growers on our panel on how they prepare their fields and implement on farm recharge. Um, as in the previous section or session, please feel free to add Got it. your questions in the chat. And we have a section after this presentation and the panel discussion to answer any questions that you might have. Um, so as I mentioned, our panel is comprised of three growers. Some of them farm in multiple counties and, um, but they all have our, will have implemented on-farm recharge on their fields in three distinct regions of the San Joaquin Valley. Those growers are Eric Harkson, Gerdial Gruwal, who hopefully is joining us soon, and Karun Samran. Also, our agronomist, Rogel Rogers, is going to talk about his work with growers throughout the Central Valley in assessing if on-farm recharge is a good fit for their fields, their cropping systems, and in the specific regions where they farm and where they're interested in doing recharge. Um, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but I just wanna make sure we're all on the same page as far as what on-farm recharge is. And so in the example of a water district um, in, in a year like this, in a flood release year, when flood releases exceed the limit, the capacity of dedicated recharge basins. It's diverting that water to agricultural fields, either active fields with crops that are uh, already being grown there if they're permanent crops like orchards or vineyards, or even seasonal um, annual crops, or even preferably fallow fields where you don't really have to um, 
worry about crop health concerns and whatnot. And um, okay, and it looks like Gertie all just joined us. So hello, Gertie all. Okay, next slide. Uh, the second slide, which is the agenda slide. Sorry. Yeah, right there. Perfect. Okay, so here's a look at our agenda. Um, first, the growers are going to give a brief introduction about themselves and their farming operations, not get into their on-farm recharge yet. And then Rogel is going to go over the key criteria needed for successful on-farm recharge. Next, the growers will get into more details about on-farm recharge they've performed specifically this winter. Um, and then we have three general questions for the, the, the three growers on our panel today. And then finally, we'll field any um, questions that you all might have. And next slide. And with that, we're going to go ahead and kick it over to um, Gertie All, who's going to talk about his farming operation. You're on mute, Gertie All. You're still on mute. There we go. Okay. Name is uh, Gertie All Graywall, and uh, I farm in Madera and Fresno counties. And it's a family operation with a mother and uh, three brothers. And uh, we farm uh, about a thousand acres, 400 of it is peaches, 250 almonds, 250 grapes, and about a uh, hundred acres of pistachios. And uh, we're been flood irrigating. And then within the last 15 years, we went to double line drip and uh, microjet in order to save up on the water and that's about it thanks gertie all next slide all right karun karun can you give a brief introduction about yourself and your farming operation morning everyone my name is garden salmon i don't got the best lighting in here so you'll just see my shadow really um, yeah, so from Madera, California, my family, we have a farming operation that spans from uh, all the way down to Kern County, farming and state water projects all the way up to Merced County and Merced Irrigation District. Our whole base is Madera County, and then Madera County, we're in districts and wide area. So we got a little taste of everything uh, when it comes to water. Um, we farm almonds, pistachios, and wine grapes. Uh, when it comes to recharge, uh, I kind of started dabbling with it back in 2017. You know, back in 2017, we all knew what Sigma was. We just didn't know what Sigma would become at that time in 2017, <clears throat> a super wet year. I took some water, tried to see how it, uh, it would work out. 2019, built on it. And then I was, like every every wet year, uh, I found an opportunity to kind of keep the dealing on more and more on-farm recharge, just because I kind of understood at the beginning, like, hey, for all the districts, white and white areas, like this is the way you're gonna have to get through the hurdles of Sigma because it doesn't look like anytime soon that infrastructure projects are coming. So if we wanna secure our water futures, it's gonna have to be on the essence of the growers. Great, thank you, Karun. And you'll be able to get into more detail of your recharge later too. Uh, next slide, please. And we have Eric. Good morning. My name is Eric Harks, and I farm up here in Marissa County, town of Belico. We're uh, irrigated by the Turlock Irrigation District, and we farm approximately 300 acres of our own and about 100 acres that's leased of almonds. We have a little bit of walnuts that's in MID, and we also run about 500 hives of honeybees. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. Next slide, please. So now we're going to kick it over to Rogel. And Rogel, you work with a lot of growers up and down the Central Valley, including the Sacramento Valley, with various levels of experience implementing on farm recharge and who both are in water districts and in white areas. What are the key factors that growers need to consider and that you analyze um, to determine whether or not on farm recharge is right for them, their fields? their crops and their regions? Well, Joe, let's start with the question, how do uh, growers and landowners uh, prepare their field for on-farm recharge? Uh, 
and consider is on farm recharge right for them, their fields, uh, their crops, uh, and their region. Um, I always uh, start with the considerations for uh, what I call the considerations for achieving successful on farm recharge. Um, step one, I start with is there water availability? Uh, is there uh, water rights in place uh, that will allow for uh, access to uh, surface, excess surface flows and diversion of water uh, from source uh, to uh, the on-farm recharge? Uh, so I call the source of water A, uh, point A, source of water, uh, to point B, uh, on-farm recharge site. Uh, is this permitted? Uh, and contact with the water district is very important to uh, determine, uh, is their surface waters uh, available? Uh, will they provide them uh, under uh, the water district's uh, mm -hmm. Rights and growers uh, have to make sure that they have appropriate water rights. Uh, if uh, wherever they're sourcing the water from, if it's from the water district, uh, uh, a river, uh, a bypass, etc. So if you can check off number one that you have a uh, water source, it's accessible, and you. Uh, have water rights, uh, then we can go on to step two, which is uh, recharge suitability, land uh, recharge suitability is looking at various features like topsoil conditions, uh, the uh, deeper geology of the soil, uh, depth to groundwater, uh, depth to uh, aquifer levels. Uh, we use typically land suitability tools like uh, land IQ, uh, recharge suitability index. We use the soil agricultural groundwater banking index, uh, acronym SAGVI. That one's developed by California uh, Soil Resource a uh, lab at UC Davis. And if we can determine that the soil is suitable, um, we have the possibility to recharge that site. And there are basically five uh, levels or five uh, factors that are examined uh, to determine suitability. One is deep percolation, B, root zone residency, uh, to uh, see uh, topography, uh, uh, D, chemical limitations, uh, E, soil uh, surface conditions. So these are the five factors that are important. If you can determine that these factors uh, are contributing to a rating that is either excellent uh, to uh, very good, to good. These are uh, ideal soils. The ratings are, uh, there are six ratings from uh, excellent to uh, very poor. And uh, let's assume that the land has been determined to have an excellent soil. Uh, so we can check off uh, recharge suitability. Uh, Let's go to the next step, and that would be crop suitability. We want to determine if the plant rootstock has tolerance to wet conditions that can promote disease. Uh, if you have a rootstock that is in the field uh, that has high, moderate, uh, or low tolerance to wet conditions, then uh, you want to make sure that you have a crop that has 
high to moderate tolerance to wet conditions, uh, meaning that it's less susceptible to uh, disease, uh, uh, possible disease. And if you've got a low tolerance uh, rootstock to uh, wet conditions, that means that you might, you know, uh, consider uh, not uh, recharging because those are uh, rootstocks that may be highly susceptible. And then you want to avoid fields that have pre-existing uh, conditions in the field that uh, could uh, promote disease. For example, if you got root rot already in the field, you need to decide the best timing of recharge based on plant physiology and growth stage. Uh, you know, you, you don't definitely don't want to uh, flood the fields, for example, uh, if you're right in the middle of uh, fruit development or you just apply fertilizer. Uh, the fourth uh, step uh, is infrastructure. Infrastructure is very important. We want to talk about equipment needs. What uh, is the plumbing needed? Do you need turnouts? Do you need conveyance pipe? Do you need temporary layout pipe? pipe to transport water from point A, uh, the water source to point B, uh, the on-farm recharge site. Uh, if we've determined uh, what the uh, infrastructure needs are, you can do a cost analysis, analysis and determine uh, how you get that job done. Um, or you may already have most of the infrastructure in place if you didn't rip out your infrastructure uh, 10, 15 years ago when we were getting into drip irrigation. Uh, let's assume that you've checked off the infrastructure. All your infrastructure is in place. Uh, five, field preparation. You want to make sure before you apply on-farm recharge uh, or apply uh, floodwaters to your field, ensure that the conveyance infrastructure works properly. Do a dry run test to ensure that there are no uh, uh, errors in the infrastructure that may create uh, unwanted uh, consequences uh, as a result of uh, diverting water to your field. Uh, and then there's the field setup uh, for water infiltration. Based on uh, the field's conditions, primarily uh, growers uh, should give their opinion on how the uh, assessment tools, whether it's uh, the land IQ uh, uh, two or the SAGVI two for uh, assessing the land uh, suitability. Uh, whatever that rating is, talk to the grower because the grower may have a better idea uh, because he's ha he has the direct field experience on how his field uh, receives water. It may have a, a very poor rating. The grower may tell you that there are certain strips in the field that are sandy that take on water very well. Determine the best field setup to regulate the water in the field and move water throughout the field without unintended consequences. There are various ways to do this. You can set your fields up with alternate row irrigation. Uh, basically, I like this uh, setup because it allows for about 50% of the field to be dry while the other 50% is wet and you can enter in and out of the field while the recharge is, is occurring and you can, uh, you know, inspect your field. Or you might have a need to do outer perimeter uh, uh, high uh, bed uh, checks, uh, 12 to 18 inches, because one side of the field has a uh, slope that will uh, allow free water to run into the uh, public road. So you might want to do a high border check along those sides or the, the entire perimeter various ways to set up the field to regulate the water movement. And last, and there are a lot of things involved to making this decision, not least is water quality. Um, and I say that to say this, water quality is, a, is one of our most important concerns environmentally. We wanna determine if uh, the history of the field is showing any excessive fertilizer nutrients, uh, fertilizer or nutrient or pesticide uh, application or hazardous exposures. Uh, we wanna make sure that the groundwater quality is not impaired by nitrate, nitrogen and other hazardous chemicals. Uh, we wanna check the Valdos 
zone uh, history for legacy nitrogen levels that can be leaching uh, uh, during the uh, recharge. Uh, and if we can uh, verify that there's no issues here, that the uh, levels of uh, groundwater nitrate are relatively low, then we also want to study the uh, management practices at the field. Is there a sound nitrogen management pl plan in place? Is there a sound irrigated, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, integrated pest management plan in place? Uh, these uh, plans uh, can identify that a grower is doing the right thing. And uh, last, you, you want to make, uh, you want to take a pre-flood soil uh, nitrate and salinity test to determine current low levels in the soil uh, is safe to do on-farm recharge. And uh, uh, encourage uh, growers to talk directly to their crop control advisors and their pest control advisors to ensure that they help follow sound uh, nitrogen management plans and sound, sound irrigated pest management plans. Their plans should be compatible with the on-farm recharge to avoid leaching of nitrate nitrogen and other hazardous chemicals. Generally, when you start your recharge, you wanna see a soil level that has uh, nitrate nitrogen levels uh, less than five uh, or five or less. And you wanna see salinity levels that are lower than you know, 1.0 millimoles per centimeter, for example. And I try to do my best in covering uh, a number of steps involved uh, Thanks, Rizal. So at this point, I'll give it to Joe. Thank you so much, Rizal. Uh, next slide, please. All right, Eric, um, if you can summarize how you utilize stormwater to recharge your almond orchard in Turlock ID, that'd be great. Okay, so in Turlock Irrigation District, we're irrigated off of the, my parcel's irrigated off the Highline Canal during storm events the mustang creek which is a a creek that runs into the highline canal when it rains a heavy amount it'll fill the mustang creek mustang creek will fill into the highline canal and working with the turlock irrigation district they built up the highline canal to make it feasible that i could pump the water out of the irrigation district with a booster pump that we normally use during the irrigation season and I pump it uphill to my ranch where we uh, use the water on a 20 acre parcel to flood it out multiple times to uh, recharge the groundwater with the flood water coming off of the Mustang Creek. Great, thank you. Um, before we shift to the next slide, the photos that Rajel provided, these are photos that Rajel took can you describe a little bit about some of the practices that you did here um, to accelerate storm? Yeah, so this is a, a 20 acre block that has been a flood block since, I was been a, since I've been a kid. We had recently about 10, 15 years ago, put it into solid set sprinklers. So we didn't have the, the levees to, to run the water down anymore. So in, in anticipation of the possibility of doing the groundwater recharge, if the rains came, um, I pulled up levees every fourth row and um, like a three foot levee every fourth row across the orchard. And then um, when the rains came, the canal filled, we flooded it out. And then there was a, that was probably around Christmas time, I imagine. And then we took the levees down after the field dried out. And then some more rains came there the next year, this year. And we pulled levees up again and, and then flooded it again. Great, thank you. Okay, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, Gertie, if you're able to summarize your on-farm recharge and, and then we can come back to these photos too um, at the end or if you're able to talk about them. Okay, we get our water from Madeira Irrigation District and uh, have to go in there, fill out all the paperwork and then call the ditch tender and they fill up our ditches and we get water in there. I had 150 acre block of uh, grapes 
that I put water on. And then uh, I had some almond trees. As you can see in the middle slide, I pushed half of the orchard out, 18 acres. The other 18 acres are still standing. And uh, so we flood irrigated those. We flood irrigated everything. First, we went into the grapes, flooded them, got the whole field wet. Then we brought the same water over to the almond block, which was, is a real sandy area. Like uh, Rajel said, you got to know where the sand is and where the water is going to percolate down fastest. And uh, that water was just going straight down. So we turned on another second uh, pump to pump more water in there. And we kept it going for three weeks, just going back and forth through that field and back over to the grape field. And uh, we were, as you can see, the third slide is of our grape vineyard. And, uh, you know, we just kept it going. And uh, as you can see, the grapes needed to be pruned. So I had to shut the water off so we can get the pruning done. But uh, that is what we did. We just put the furrows up as uh, Eric did. And uh, just to keep the water from going from one place to the other, we just drove a tractor right down the middle and uh, flooded everything. Just try to get that water down to the aquifers. All right. Great, thank you. Um, you're also, all three of the growers on the panel today are on-farm recharge demonstration sites or pilot sites. One through our Department of Water Resource contract and Gertie all you're also a recipient of the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service on-farm recharge pilot program. Can you describe a little bit about that? Yes, I put in two fields that, you know, have plantings on them, like uh, the grape vineyard, 50 acres of grape vineyard, and uh, the field that uh, is pushed over in the middle slide. Originally, I put in five acres of it, but uh, since, you know, we pushed it over, we thought we'd put water on the whole thing. So I have 18 acres on that. And then I'm also building a basin for recharge also. It's about a five acres basin. We got to get it cleaned up. I got, you know, the word came in too late in December, so I could not get that built. But uh, we're working on that also to get have Madeira Irrigation help us in that form of getting water to the basin. That way we could fill it up on these wet years. And maybe even during the summer, if they have extra water, just to make sure the water gets down into our aquifers that are really hurting. Great. Thank you, Gertie. All water table in my area is going down real fast. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. All right, Karun, um, you mentioned earlier that you've been doing this on-farm recharge for several years, I think dating back to 2017, possibly, and on multiple crops. Um, so if you could kind of summarize your um, experience doing on-farm recharge and specifically preparing your fields for that, that'd be great. Yeah, so to start off with this ranch, this is the ranch Rogel and you, you guys maybe checked out. So this one was about um, 165 acres of almonds. And fortunately enough, um, they still had the flood irrigation valves set up on every other row. So for me, it was just pretty much easy. Just once the district, uh, this was done in Chachilla Water District on the western edge of McGarry County. So when the water was going to become available in January, all I had to do was call the district signed a contract and then they started pushing water my way. Um, between the 165 acres, just strictly flood and filling up my pond a couple of times and letting that draw down, I recharged about 1.3 acre feet in less than a month. I had to cut it off um, early February, I wanna say before the 15th because of bloom. I didn't wanna have saturated soil conditions going to bloom. Back in 2017, at a separate field, I ran into an issue where I recharged too late, or yeah, recharged too deep into February, and that actually caused the soil to be too high in moisture, and that was a detriment to the crop. So I crop. So I learned my lesson this time. I knew that hey, even though like it's nice to keep dumping the water on, but I knew I had to cut it off early. As you can see, I had 
cover crop going down the middle. I also do composting on the berms. And basically it was simple enough, we were just opening up the valve. Um, then by the end of the, we'd come back in the morning and just shut them off and it would even reach the other end. If these are quarter mile runs, it's just what the soil and the cover crop, it was just the water was just being drank up by the crown. And we can come back two days later or a day later after we shut off the valves and the water would just, there'd be no puddle of water anywhere. So between the 165 acres, we were able to nonstop go back and forth. And I mean, uh, going forward, maybe start back up again. Uh, what was enticing was the water was made available at a fair rate for us growers to do this. Going forward, I don't know if that's the case. And, um, but I also have been doing recharge on a whole bunch of other locations. I mean, albeit through just filling up ponds, letting them come down and fill them back up again, or just running through the drip. Great, thank you. And so what are all the crops that you've implemented on farm recharge on? Um, pistachios, wine grapes, and almonds. Great, thank you, Karun. Um, next slide is we're going to be getting into the questions for all three growers. And this first question is, what have you learned since you've started implementing on-farm recharge? And what advice would you give to other growers on how to successfully implement and conduct on-farm recharge? We could start with, let, let's go ahead and start with Gertie all if you're, if, if you have a response to this question I have a response I think it's a very serious problem and uh, we need to address it not just one or two farmers out of the county I think everybody needs to take part in this because uh it's just a serious issue I'm going to give you a little story okay in uh 1997 okay I had a well here I built my house and I had a well drilled and the standing water was at 107 feet, okay? Now, last year, 25 years later, that well ran out of water. And the standing water is at 285 feet. Okay, 25 years later, it, the, the water table went down 178 feet, okay? That, you know, and I divided it by 25, that's 7.12 feet per year. And that's very serious. In my area, I've got a lot of wells. Last five, six years, I've been getting new wells drilled because the water table is just going down. The wells are getting real bad. And, uh, you know, all our good water is down to about 800 feet in my area in Madera County. Okay. So in that, if you divide that backwards, you know, that says that we only got water. If it stays at 7.12 feet per year, for about 72, 73 years. We're going to run out of water if we don't address this issue. And it can't be just me, can't be just Karun or Eric. It has to be a lot more people. I think the NRCS or whomever, everybody needs to jump in on this, the government. And, uh, you know, we need to advise, we need to make other growers aware. There's a lot of people that are not aware of this issue. And uh, I really wasn't aware either till, you know, I went back and looked at the record, how much the water had gone down and everything. And uh, we need to address this issue real bad. And we Thank need you. to fix our, as Rajel, I mean, he did everything, you know, in his outline earlier. Perfect. I've got infrastructure, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it was for saving water. So we went from flood irrigation to double line drip and microjet systems. We took out some of our flood irrigation infrastructure. We need help to put that back together. In years, where wet years, or even during dry years, we need to get cheaper water, as Karun said, to fill up or flood irrigate and you know, keep feeding the lower aquifers is, is my point of view. Thank you so much, Gertie Arnold. You're welcome. Um, Kar Karun, do you have a response to this question? Yeah, so I got a couple points. Um, first off, uh, I think the biggest thing is, um, you know, 
as a grower, you know your field best. Um, you really got to go out there. You got to identify the best sites for recharge. I had some blocks I've been doing recharge on that if you were going sag beat, it, it would be braided poor. But because I was able to put some fresh water on compared to well water, the ground just drank it up. But then on the flip side, I had some fields that had some really good sag beat rating. But then it was like four or five feet down, I was running the hard pan layers and, and I was developing just top foot. You got to go down five, six feet. And that might include some backhoe uh, pits and stuff. But that's if you really want to be successful, you got to identify the best sites where the water can take the, where the ground can take the water pretty well, but at the same time, preserving your crop. Second thing is um, you got to kind of, if you want to be successful with on-farm recharge, and this is why, like, this is my third chance at it, because we've only, in, in the Madera County and some of these other counties, this has only been 2017, 2019, now this year, you, you, there's a very, very limited chance. You can't keep trying and experimenting year in, year out. It's like, that's why it's like every year, I'm always trying to do more and more just so I can learn where my pitfalls are, where my successes are. So that's where I try to urge everybody is like, you kind of have to go in to every winter with the mentality that it could be a wet year. I know it's tough when it's like a mega drought how we kind of had the last two years. No one foresaw a year like this. I mean, with these rains, you know, looking like to be a top five wettest season in California after one of the driest years in California. But if you are to be really successful with long-farm recharge, you kind of have to have that, that, that mentality I had some on-farm uh, recharge projects where, you know, we weren't really ready. We were caught flat-footed, and then we had to divert some water from some bypasses and rivers, and it was tough to go get the infrastructure, aluminum pipes, pumps, because next thing you know, everybody was out trying to rent the same stuff. And so we missed out on, you know, some precious time to do some recharge in some other location. So that's my two tidbits. Great, thank you. Um... And I was just notified that we have a little extra time. So we have until 11. So we have 10 more minutes. So you mentioned growers and landowners being prepared basically in the fall going into the winter rainy season and having to anticipate like there could be water available for recharge. And you mentioned infrastructure like having aluminum pipe, having pumps. What are some other things that you do going into the rainy season to make sure your fields are ready for, for recharge? One thing that I've had to uh, really start adjusting is even when it comes to like just simple orchard work or, you know, field work, maybe you got to start getting pruning done earlier because you don't want to be running to a time when there's precious water flowing by and you can't be putting on your field because you're like, oh, I still need to do this pruning or I got to do this and this. So that's when it was like, right when harvest is done this year, I I, acted, I just kind of kept that same like, you know, fifth gear approach. Like we pushed hard to get all the pruning done, pushed hard to get all the composting done, pushed hard to get plant the cover crop because I wanted to be done just in case, you know, the flood flows did come in January, February. I didn't have to stop recharging to go do some field work that I could have done if I was just more proactive post-harvest. Yes. Great. Thank you. Heard y'all, did you have something to add to that or? No, I just agreed with him. I just yeah. agreed. <laughs> yeah. All right, Eric, do you have a response to this and specifically regarding your situation in Turlock ID? Yes, for me, I guess the biggest thing I learned is is the first off that you can you can do it. Um, and the the biggest thing that I learned was is the amount of water that that the ground took up. And we're in the and I think our uh, my soil is classified as as a Del High Sandy Loam, but um, the amount of water we took up normally when that block was irrigated, it took a two hour it was a two hour check, and it was taking us four to six hours to irrigate those those checks because the the it, and it already rained several inches on top of it so the biggest thing that i learned is how much water the the ground could take how quickly it was taking it and and with what little there was no damage at all you know always a concern about some of the neighboring farmers like oh it's going to cause phythoptera it's going to 
waterlog your trees. It's going to do all these different things. And I got a perfect example. I got a, a sprinkler block next to it and then a flood block on the other side. And, you know, they're concerned about it was going to warm the, the soil up and, and going to make the trees bloom earlier. There was no, no consequences whatsoever to any of the on water on the on farm recharge that I did. And uh, it, it worked out great. And again, the biggest trouble was you're, you were out there, you know, like on Christmas Eve or you know Christmas day trying to flood irrigate or, you know, new year's Eve or whatever. And, and, and flood irrigating um, that was the biggest inconvenience by it. But other than that, it, it all worked out great. Great. Thank you, Eric. All right. Let's move on to the next grower question. Um, so what were the major challenges or obstacles you experiment experienced in implementing on-farm recharge on your on-farm recharge pilot site or really any field that you implemented on-farm recharge? And whoever's ready to go can jump ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll start off. Um, one of my other fields, like back in 2017, I ran an issue where I put on, I kind of briefed about it earlier, but I put on too much water too late. And then, the, and I had a hard pen layer five feet down, and that created a perch water table. The next thing you know, I had of my trees, my almond, this is an almond block. The crop all got aborted. I called the farm advisor, and they were, they, they did some augury, and they're like, yeah, you had standing water, and that standing water, um, your tap roots were just sitting in water that created ethylene in the tree and that dropped all the crop and started suckers going shoot up straight up. So that's something as you know, as a grower, if you're trying to do on-farm recharge on almonds, you gotta be aware of that risk. Um, it's a little bit easier to do on your grapes and your pistachios, because I I've been I've been recharging over there and I have to stop because I still have you have a longer window. Another challenge is um which kind of, you know, use some then just kind of put it to bed a little bit, but it's permitting and fish screens and all that stuff. Um, we're trying to do bigger projects out here on some wider projects, but we don't know what we can do yet because we're still kind of going through all these hassles of permits and fish screens on, on these bypasses and stuff. So as I kind of mentioned, like, these wet years are spontaneous and we're losing a lot of people didn't in our year didn't do the recharges here because the, they didn't have the permits or there was no uh, protocol set in place by the local GSA because there were no permits or fish screens. So there's a lot of potential recharge that we all missed out on just because of that. And so and that's more of like a state water board issue and department of fish and wildlife, but they got also come to terms that, you know, Whenever that water's flowing, we should also take advantage and it needs to, the whole permitting process needs to be a little more streamlined. They need to understand more about the pitfalls of why, you know, some areas may, some areas may need a fish screen, but where we are, like fish screens aren't important because it's a dry channel seven years out of 10. So, and because of that, the GSAs are too scared to make the step if the states haven't made the protocol set up yet. Thanks, Karun. Interesting perspectives on wide area recharge versus in district. Gertie all um, or Eric, do you guys have a, any responses to this question? Yes. So for me, the the biggest challenge I had was, you know, it, our our block is an elevated block. So if you know, obviously, you don't want to uh, wash out the bank into the neighbor and that kind of stuff. But um, and then in our canal system. The water I am taking is, is is from the Mustang Creek, and it is more or less flooding into the canal. So it was great with TID; they they monitored it. But if if the if we would have received more rain or whatnot, you know, there was an issue if, if we would have to tear down the canal and, and run it for flooding, you know, purposes. So they they managed all that and did all that stuff for me. But that was you know you know one of the concerns that we'd have to build the canal up and then tear the canal down, and and they did all that, and that was great. Um, I can say for me, the biggest challenge was being out there and, and maintaining the water and, and following it and, you know, you know, until midnight or whatever, until we shut the water off, it was the, just more or less babysitting the water. But I mean, other than that, everything worked great with the, we had, that block does have cover crops in it. We did have our brush shred already. Um, so we were prepared for that. And um, yeah, that's the biggest the challenge we had was just more or less managing the water. Thank you. Um, 
My challenges, Gurdiel, my challenges were just the cost of farming is getting so expensive. I mean, you look at the water. Last year, we paid over $220 an acre foot for water. And then, you know, the fuel's gone up. Electricity is almost doubled in the last few years. Late cost of labor seems like it's going up about 10% every year. And then, you know, your fertilizers, your chemicals, everything there as far as farming is going up. And what are we getting on our almonds? We're only getting a dollar, dollar 25. So you got to look at the cost. Everybody thinks the farmer is making money. We're not making money. That's why we need, you know, help from the government, from you guys to make, you know, you guys did an excellent job. Joe, you, Rogel, when you guys came to the Madera Irrigation District, you guys had that workshop and you guys sent out newsletters making people aware of the situation that we are in. You know, I thank you guys for doing that, but we need to keep doing, you know, stuff like that. There's a lot of farmers that still do not think there is an issue out there, but we need to address this issue real bad. And some of the challenges that I have is like I said before, I need to replace my lines if I'm gonna keep doing this, you know, that's extra cost also. My infrastructure that I took out, I thought we, you know, we didn't need to do this and we were going to go out and save water, you know, and then we went to double line drip. We went to microjet this and that. But if you come back, we need that. We need to keep flood irrigating. If we have extra water, we need to, you know, put it on during the summer and uh, those months also that we don't just do this during the winter. We need to address this issue during the summer and we need to not only one person, the whole county needs to do it in part of Madera. And, you know, we're going out there, we're planting cover crops and, you know, we're trying to do anything and everything to help our soils, help the water penetration go down. And, you know, sandier soil is going to take more water than if you got clay soils, especially if you got hard pan, you're not going to take much so, so you got to know your soil. You got to know where to put the water on so you don't waste it either. So I think, you know, there's a lot of challenges out there with your help. And if we can get the government to help us with incentives to lower the cost, if we're recharging, I think the cost should be lower, you know, for us putting the water on to where we're helping the underground water. Thank Those you. Are my thoughts. Thanks, Gurdiel. And we're running out of time here, and we did receive quite a few questions from the audience. Um, Joe, even, I, I, we yeah. need to we need okay. to move it on, but um, I'm going to. We, I was loving all of the questions that came in from the chat, and I I hope um, there are a couple of email addresses up on the screen. Is the best way, um, perhaps. Uh, to answer those questions is uh, to follow up with Joe or Rogel offline. Um, and thank you. And sorry we ran over. I know um, it's a really fruitful discussion, and we we love hearing all about it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, we're going to break for five minutes and come back at 11:05 for the last session that we have planned. Um, and. Uh, with that, I'm going to go refill my water and uh, we'll see you guys back shortly. Thank you. Let me get out of here. Hello. Are we done? Hello, yeah. Yes, is this Gertie Al? Yeah. Hi, Gertie Al. Yes. Uh, great job. Uh, <laughs> great job.
All right. Welcome back, everybody. Give you just one moment to come back to your desks. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass the microphone over to Asia Massell, who um, I, I think, I can't recall, Asia, if you said hello to the group yet, but um, uh, we are going to go ahead and take the next 45 minutes all the way up until 1150 for these uh, next few presenters. Um, and let me know if you'd like me to um, share my screen. Would you like that? Or do you have your slides that you'd like to run through? Do you have all the presentations? Um, I do. Actually, I'll let you, I'll go ahead and share my screen. And then if any presenters would prefer, they may uh, they may do that. Great. But go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Aisha Massell. I'm with Sustainable Conservation and happy to just get this conversation going. Really, it's going to be um, could ask the presenters to come on camera. Uh, we're going to start off with Kristen Colbert from American Rivers. Um, well, before I introduce folks, I um, just want to say that I'm super excited about this aspect of Floodmar and Recharge, which is really looking at the multi-benefits. You know, it was really fascinating to listen to the growers talking in the previous session. And this is just kind of another way of looking at, you know, how to do recharge. Uh, so starting off with Kristen Colbert, American Rivers, followed by um, Angela Islas from Civic Well and followed by Anna Schiller from Environmental Defense Fund, and then also Wendy Rash from uh, the NRCS. So all talking about some really interesting topics. So um, we'll get started with Kristen. Great, thank you, Aisha. So uh, first, before I begin, let me go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Kristen Colbert, and I am Associate Director of California Central Valley River Conservation at American Rivers. So um, today I'm going to be talking about uh, restoring rivers and reconnecting floodplains for multiple vet benefits, including groundwater recharge. Uh, next slide. So as you may or may not know, the process of restoring a creek, a stream, or river is a pretty involved process. It can take some time, it can take years. Uh, it often involves um, pretty extensive stakeholder engagement with numerous project partners and a significant amount of coordination uh, that involves uh, planning for uh, design for restoration project, uh, completing permitting requirements, and actual implementation. Uh, that's the getting things done part. <laughs> um, so you might wonder, why should we be in the business of restoring rivers? Well, restoring rivers can create benefits for landowners, communities, and local economies that are pretty vast in nature. Uh, it can include replenishment of groundwater aquifers and groundwater supply, uh, flood risk reduction benefits, such as lowering flood stage of rivers, which reduces stress on existing levees, uh, economic benefits and job creation. Next slide, please. Uh, creation and enhancement of uh, existing wildlife um, habitat, including habitat for fish, such as anadromous fish like salmon, uh, pollinators that may be key to uh, pollination of nearby cropland, and bird habitat. Uh, also, restoring rivers creates uh, recreation and access opportunities, particularly on public lands. Uh, for nearby communities. And finally, uh, it can lead to the preservation of cultural, historical, and uh, natural history, which is important to uh, many communities, stakeholders, and has intrinsic value. Next slide. So on the flip side, when we don't have the opportunity to restore rivers, uh, that can lead to disconnection of floodplains. And that can lead to consequences that, you know, aren't great for nature, but can also uh, negatively impact uh, nearby communities, uh, growers, and others. It can reduce opportunities for on floodplain uh, groundwater recharge. 
It can lead to crop losses from farmland that floods frequently, um, potentially because of levees that uh, break or are destroyed during um, flood events. And it can create fuel opportunities to access nature and generate economic activity from hunting, fishing, and tourism um, impacting local economies. Next slide. So when we have the opportunity to actually reconnect floodplains and restore rivers, we allow rivers to have enough room to slow down and spread. And this leads to flows having the opportunity to exp expand onto floodplains and recharge groundwater aquifers, bolstering uh, groundwater supply and improving supply for nearby communities. Floodwaters also have the opportunity to flow into rivers instead of towns, cities or valuable cropland. Um, so it can be managed. Next slide. So here's a slide summarizing all of the amazing and important co-benefits that result from when we have the opportunity to restore rivers, reconnect floodplains, and ensure the health of riparian corridors. As I mentioned, some of the co-benefits include uh, allowing for groundwater uh, recharge um, and replenishment of aquifers leading to increased supply, uh, carbon storage and climate mitigation, um, opportunities for recreation such as fishing, hunting, and passive nature enjoyment on public lands, um, improvements to water quality, improving local economies, increased pollination of crops, and reducing flood risk. So there are many co-benefits to really make sure and making sure that we have opportunities to restore rivers. Next slide. So I'd like to shift gears a little bit and talk more about um, park access and open space access uh, in a region that I work in um, and think about these ideas. So as I mentioned, um, I'm Associate Director of California Central Valley River Conservation. And in my job, um, I'm a project manager and I think a lot about and manage uh, floodplain restoration projects um, and river restoration projects in the Central Valley. And um, I've found, my colleagues and I have found in our work that you know, there are many communities within the Central Valley that do not have opportunities to access and enjoy open space and parks and nature uh, when compared to other communities in California. What you're looking at on your screen right now is a graphic from 2017 data looking at park poverty in California's Central Valley. So you can see at the very top, we have the San Diego metropolitan area, Los Angeles, and San Francisco metropolitan areas. Um, each of those little trees represent one acre of park per thousand people. And when compared to the Central Valley communities that I've circled in red, so Fresno as an example of a larger metropolitan area in the Central Valley and small Central Valley communities at the very bottom, you can see that park poverty, that is park access, um, is far more prevalent in the Central Valley compared to other metropolitan areas in California. So this means that people in the Central Valley on average have far fewer opportunities to go and enjoy fishing and hunting and uh, hiking and just general enjoyment of their rivers. Next slide. So when we restore rivers and American rivers, uh, we are thinking about how to uh, mitigate this uh, lack of access to um, nature and nature poverty in the Central Valley. Uh, as I mentioned before, um, Central Valley communities don't have the same amount or level of access uh, as other communities in, in California. We've also found that your status as someone uh, who is of a certain race or ethnicity um, is more indicative of the fact that you are um, 
uh, less likely to be able to access nature than someone who is low income and not necessarily a person of color. So I've put up some uh, statistics here, but I understand that we are running a little short on time. So let's go on to the next slide. So I'll touch on uh, what we do at American Rivers to try to um, really mitigate some of these uh, negative impacts of not having enough access to nature. We are using uh, existing and new tools to try and site a new river connection and new river restoration projects in areas that need it most. So what we can do and we are trying to do more of is pinpointing where exactly disadvantaged communities exist uh, and identify opportunities for um, focusing on talking to stakeholders who are interested in helping these projects happen on their land. And this allows us to really start highlighting opportunities where we can advance multi-benefit uh, floodplain restoration and river reconnection and restoration projects uh, in the Central Valley. And next slide. And this is my final slide, but I'll just talk a little bit about an existing project that came out of um, this exercise of identifying hotspots where the need is greatest within the Central Valley. So this is uh, Great Valley Grasslands. This is a state park in Merced County uh, near the small community of Stevenson. And this is um, this gorgeous 1,000 plus acre um, uh, state park in this area that simply doesn't have a whole lot of people visiting it because there are no opportunities to enjoy trails or to even just safely drive into the state park and be able to park and walk over to um, a visitor center uh, that families can enjoy. So really the only way that you can enjoy this park is you, if you have a fishing boat, if you have access to a boat, which you know I live personally in a small apartment, I don't have my own boat. I wouldn't be able to be able to enjoy this park. Um, and if you don't have that, then this is a missed nature access opportunity for you and your community. So what American Rivers is doing is working with uh, California State Parks and other local stakeholders to ensure that we're engaging with local communities, with state parks, with local uh, tribal members to understand where we can reconnect floodplains and restore the natural flow of the river while also giving consideration to how we can do so in a way that allows for future um, uh, possible construction of uh, visitor centers, trails, raised boardwalks, and other infrastructure that makes it more accessible. So this is an example of a floodplain reconnection project where we're able to tackle the problem of uh, nature poverty in the Central Valley. And with that, uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kristen. Uh, we're gonna hold on the questions until the very end. Um, so the next presenter will be Angela Islas, if you can go on camera. And um, maybe Marissa, if you can share screen again. Thank you so much again, Kristen. Thanks, Aisha. Um, I'm planning to share my screen instead, um, just because I, want to take control of my slides and try to be a little bit more uh, quicker just based on time. Just want to confirm everybody can see my screen, correct? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Great. So um, just want to thank um, Asia as well as Stantec and all others for inviting me to speak on this topic alongside American Rivers and EDF. Um, just they're both really amazing partners and um, have been very um, helpful with just kind of bringing this topic more together about um, aligning more innovative opportunities um, to connect with recharge and multi-benefit land repurposing. Um, so I'll just quickly introduce myself. My name is Angela Islas. I'm a water project manager with Civic Well. 
Um, we were formerly known as Local Government Commission. We just went through a whole year of a rebrand. Um, and for those who are just a little unfamiliar with our organization, we are a statewide nonprofit organization. We are now expanding outside of the state. Um, and most of our work is just supporting sustainable policies and um, also just supporting leaders and communities um, to work alongside with local governments um, and government agencies and other community-based organizations through policy guidance, collaborative partnership and coalitions, and through direct um, technical assistance um, that addresses certain issues related to climate change or other environmental impacts. Uh, so a lot of our work is really based here in California, but again, we are starting to expand outside of the state, so hoping to see where our work takes us uh, through this rebrand. But for my presentation, I'm going to be focusing mostly on just kind of the recharge um, conversation of multi-benefit um, from a community drinking water perspective. And so looking into how we want to innovate the idea of what we want to see recharge um, in the Central Valley, we're looking at it in a lens where we want to see like what community needs um, are there to like say that a recharge could support with access to safe drinking water, which is to this day a very important um, asset that many communities lack, um, especially here in the San Joaquin Valley region. Many communities do lack access to safe, affordable, and reliable drinking water. So looking at what opportunities there are for recharge uh, to be um, a multi-benefit for safe drinking water, um, or it could be just an improvement of water quality um, as some of the past um, presentations that I was listening in on for recharge, um, you know, recharge is kind of also seen as an opportunity to improve water quality. So looking at what uh, what this basin could do to improve some certain contaminants that are impacting a community well, or it could be impacting also private wells within those communities. Um, just kind of evaluating that benefit um, through if that's really a need that the community is looking to see this um, kind of project um, support. Um, but others that I have on the slide here it's just other opportunities for, you know, just kind of expanding more of habitat restoration. Some communities may want to look into that, or as Kristen had mentioned in a previous slide, um, opportunities for more green space and parkway um, availability for communities to actually have access to go and um, do more like recreational activities um, or even do more kind of more social gatherings with family or even community uh, to just kind of help um, bring more wellness um, in their area. So that's, this is kind of an approach that um, through many projects that I'm aware of um, that are currently going on here in the Central Valley, one that um, myself, um, our organization is a part of in Madera County um, is a groundwater resiliency project. Um, and this project is focused in the community of Fairmead. Um, the project is led by Madera Water Natural Resources Department. Um, we do have partners um, who are participating in this project, which is Sustainable Conservation, Leadership Council for Justice and Accountability. Um, we're collectively together as major stakeholders, we're supporting the small community of Fairmead to build a more collective plan in terms of like how recharge and other multi-benefit opportunities could, could actually support more climate resiliency and groundwater resilience in their community. And the plan itself right now is sort of still in the beginning stages as we are um, still working alongside with the community to just kind of build more on engagement and um, kind of just, you know, map out exactly the opportunities that we can build off um, in presenting the options to the community uh, for then in the end, this being more of a community driven process. So we're kind of in a way giving more power to the community to see the options and then decide for themselves 
what makes more sense and what would be more innovating of a solution to support their current needs um, that they are just kind of needing more of water supply management or if they're in need for more parkway space. That's kind of what um, we're hoping <laughs> that this plan that we develop with the community overall just kind of brings as more of like solutions as opposed to just kind of maybe one that may not fully benefit the full community itself. So from these two options, um, these are other considerations that the plan is um, looking into, but looking at it from the multi-benefit innovative perspective, when it comes to community drinking water, there's gonna be a lot of different, um, I guess, opinions or also different like views that the community may have. Um, so in the end, you know, given the recent flooding um, issues that many of our regions had faced um, with the recent rainstorms, uh, the Fermi community may see that stormwater improvements is something that they wanna look into. Um, and the community does face very heavy flooding um, as their area is just, you know, it's not really fully in capacity to kind of take away a lot of the water flow that is coming into their community. So looking at recharge as that opportunity to reduce um, and improve stormwater um, is something that that could be possible um, if we're looking at it also through a multi-benefit land repurposing kind of lens. And then through climate adaptation, again, just showing you that this is a, a, a opportunity as well of what we could see recharge do uh, for the community. So lastly, just to kind of end uh, my presentation, it was pretty quick, but it is kind of more direct and to the point of what it looks like to really kind of have a process be more community driven and allow the opportunity for communities to be at the table when designing a lot of these projects. Um, and there's, there's so many opportunities and so many different ways to engage communities and also bring communities um, to just kind of directly start planning things out. But I feel like now with a lot of the climate changing and a lot of the different um, impacts that many of us are facing, um, I know that a lot of our farmers, a lot of our um, irrigators and a lot of different um, stakeholders are really facing um, these impacts directly. We also want to make sure that we focus on consensus building as a really, as a gateway to show that we, we can see the many opportunities that everybody could benefit from through recharge. So in the end, I, I do wanna end just saying that there, there is hope and opportunity um, there to really bring the communities to the table um, and be able to actually work on consensus building um, as an opportunity to see more innovations to come uh, through these projects. So just wanna thank everyone again for inviting me. And if you do have any questions um, from just some of the previous content I shared in the slides, um, feel free to give me an email or just give me a call and just happy to really discuss through anything. Thank you so much, guys. Thanks so much, Angela. Um, really wonderful ideas in there. Um, I just wanna encourage our audience folks to um, send questions in the chat. And maybe, you know, if you have a question for a specific speaker, put their name at the front. We will have a few minutes at the very end to ask questions. So we can just line them up quickly that way. So our next presenter is Anna Schiller from Environmental Defense Fund. And Anna, um, will you share your own screen or do you need someone else to share it? I will be sharing my screen. Um... Great. Um, well, thank you so much, Aisha. Um, it's really a pleasure to be joining you all today and speaking on this panel. Um, huge thank you for, to Chris and Angela for queuing it up so beautifully uh, with just the amount of opportunities and benefits available with multi-benefit recharge efforts and really um, painting a picture of what that can look like. Um, you know, both Chris and Angela kind of 
touched on the diversity of benefits that can be created with multi-benefit recharge projects, um, including you know, improving groundwater recharge, restoring floodplains, creating habitat, recreational opportunities for communities, improving the reliability of community wells, also potential water quality improvements possible there. Um, and also, you know, it could be a, a very fantastic use as well for repurposing marginal farmlands that are coming out of production um, as a result of water scarcity in the state. I'm going to speak a little bit more in depth on one specific type of multi-benefit recharge, just to, again, kind of continue that theme of painting specific examples of what these projects can look like. Um, in talking about specifically dedicated recharge basins that are designed to create habitat for migratory bird species. So this image here um, was created through a joint effort with Audubon California, Point Blue Conservation Sciences, and Sustainable Conservation in partnership with Environmental Defense Fund to do a deeper dive on how one could create, design, and manage a recharge basin in order to enhance bird benefits. And we've already seen some really great examples in the state of places where this has been done successfully, including the Kern Water Bank and Grasslands Water District. And some of the features that we saw that both, you know, were really helpful for creating habitat, but also had some just operational benefits to them, included things like having slope basin floors to provide a variety of water depths so you can have a broader diversity of species um, enjoying and utilizing the, those basins having natural vegetation featured in the basins rather than keeping um, uh, the berms and the and the floor of the basin devoid of vegetation which it can be a standard practice in more traditionally managed recharge basins having features like islands um, and again, sloping berms to create a, a multitude of different types of habitat from you know, nesting to foraging spaces for those bird species, as well as you know, just managing and maintaining the basin in a way that kind of mimics uh, an ecosystem. So avoiding using heavy equipment, pesticides, herbicides, and instead using you know, things like uh, grazers, like the, the fluffy sheep pictured in this image here. Um, and I'll stop there and, and drop a link in the chat to the more in-depth recharge guide, which provides uh, a little bit more detail on ways that these types of basins can be managed, but really want to highlight this opportunity, especially given where folks are at with implementing the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act right now. And we've seen so many groundwater sustainability agencies across the state um, developing plans and beginning to invest in developing these dedicated recharge basins. And we'd really love to see more of those um, designed and maintained in such a way that they could have a broader uh, array of benefits for the habitat in particular. One of the added benefits of designing basins in this way is that it kind of opens the door to more funding opportunity as well. Um, both state and federal funding sources, you know, uh, if you can create a multitude of benefits, it's just going to make that program more or that proposed project more attractive for funding. So just to highlight a handful of programs here that can be used to fund these types of multi-benefit recharge projects that create habitat. Uh, California's Wildlife Conservation Board has a Pacific Flyway program. Actually, last last year, either the year before, um, they approved their first application for a wildlife friendly recharge basin. So we know that program can really be used for these types of projects. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has a Partners for Fish and Wildlife program that works really well with private landowners who want to lead the charge on these types of projects. NRCS um, had is equip program or environmental quality incentives program can also be used to fund specific features and do cost share for uh, certain aspects of these types of wildlife friendly recharge basins, as well as California's Department of Fish and Wildlife has a California wild waterfowl habitat program. I'm going to spend a little bit more time to actually talking about a very new program, California Department of Conservation's new multi-benefit land repurposing program. Um, which Environmental Defense Fund is very much involved in, and there's actually an open application period right now. So really want to highlight this opportunity. This program was created really in response to SIGMA and under, or the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, recognizing that there are going to be large-scale land use changes associated with 
uh, implementation of that new groundwater legislation just in order to balance the equation of groundwater inputs and outputs. There will, unfortunately, but inevitably be some irrigated land coming out of production. So the goal of this program is really to support um, rather than allowing for unmanaged fallowing, which can have all sorts of negative impacts, both on the environment, local community and local economy. Um, instead, supporting coordinated regional and basin scale efforts to achieve groundwater sustainability, convert land to less water intensive water uses, restore wildlife habitat and create new benefits for low income communities are the stated goals of the new multi benefit land repurposing program. And they hope to achieve this by providing up to $10 million block grants to groundwater sustainability agencies and their local partners to fund the planning, engagement, and implementation of land repurposing projects, including floodplain restoration, habitat corridors, low impact solar, community parks, managed rangeland, and cover crops. So this can also include multi-benefit recharge projects. Briefly, uh, I'll skim through this quickly, but uh, a little timeline of when this program was established back in fall of 2021. It's administered by the Department of Conservation who's been working really quickly they released their first round of block grants um, in the spring of 2022 and, and allocated an additional $40 million to this program in fall of 2020, which means there's one more round open right now for uh, block grantees to get together. Um, partners, again, groundwork sustainability agencies and their local partners can apply for funding up to $8.89 .8 million block grants uh, for this round. And the application period is currently open, but will close March 29th. So now is the time um, to quickly get together with partners to, to submit funding applications for this program. The last or the first round of applicants, um, there were 12 regions applied and four were successful. It's very competitive. Three of those regions are in the San Joaquin Valley and one is in the lower Salinas Valley. The areas in light green on this map here show all the regions that applied. So certainly if if you see um, your region highlighting green there, um, it's very likely that there are folks in that region that will be applying for round two. And definitely want to encourage, um, especially resource conservation districts, to consider partnering up with groundwater sustainability agencies and applying for these funds. This is somewhat an overwhelming slide with the amount of um, text here and a, a bad typo actually I'm seeing in the title now, but um, the, the purpose of this slide is really just to uh, demonstrate the diversity of partners that work together on the successful block grant applications from you know county farm bureaus to resource conservation districts, nonprofits like the Nature Conservancy and Audubon, groundwater sustainability agencies and local land trusts. And these really were the most competitive applications when they had these diversity of partners working together and putting together those applications. I'm going to quickly um, highlight one successful block applicant, which is just so relevant to this conversation um, and to what we're seeing right now with devastating flooding occurring in the state as a result of these intense atmospheric river events. And that's in the lower Salinas Valley. Um, this, this application was led by the California Marine Sanctuary Foundation, was a local nonprofit, was actually the lead applicant. And then they partnered with the groundwater the local groundwater sustainability agency there, as well as um, you know, many, many other partners in the region. Um, and they were successful in receiving a nearly $9 million block grant. And with very much the intention um, for their application was to focus on floodplain restoration and multi-benefit recharge areas. Um, and get, particularly given the, um, the flood frequency um, and the vulnerability in the area, those projects um, are really intended to improve surface water quality, help with flood mitigation, flood risk mitigation, and provide habitat benefits. And while it might not be, um, you know, with a block grant of that size, it might not be enough to fully uh, prevent the types of disasters we're seeing this week. Um, certainly, we need to be putting more energy and effort and funding into these types of projects that can help uh, attenuate that risk a bit. Um, so with that, I'm going to wrap up. Definitely feel free to reach out to me if you have questions about um, that multi-benefit recharge guide or the wildlife friendly recharge guide I highlighted early, I'll drop a link in that to that in the chat. Or if you have questions about applying for this current round of multi-benefit land repurposing program funding, please feel free to shoot me an email. Um, 
Well, thank you so much. And I'll hand it back to Aisha. Thanks so much, Anna. Whoops, thanks so much. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks for all that information, Anna. Really appreciate it. And now we're gonna to go to our last presenter, uh, Wendy Rash at the NRCS. And I just wanna encourage folks, if you have a question to write it in the chat because that's gonna be the priority order. <laughs> so um, if you have a question, please do so um, during this last time. Thank you. There we go. Where's my button? Sorry about that. Um, hi, I'm Wendy Rash. I am the water quality specialist with NRCS in California. Um, and I have been uh, project managing our pilot program for groundwater recharge. And after listening to these very inspiring um, uh, presentations this afternoon or this morning, I um, am going to flash through these slides pretty quickly because several of these points have already been covered, but um, also talk a little bit about how NRCS can sort of engage not only with the on-farm recharge, uh, but with um, other types of uh, multi-benefit recharge as well. And let's go slides. Okay, so NRCS initiated a pilot program for groundwater recharge about three years ago. We developed um, interim practice standards based on all of the research and on-farm um, experimentation that was going on for recharge. Um, we developed some interim practice standards. Uh, those were approved by our national office, and we have been in the past year uh, trying to get them out on the ground um, to do some some testing of how they work within our programs. So this map is just a map of the areas where we are offering the groundwater recharge practices for funding through the EQIP program. There are lots of different ways that you can conserve water and, and recharge water on your farm. Our program is really focusing on these two, um, the intentional flooding of fields for infiltration and putting flood flows in a dedicated area, a basin or a trench. So we've, we've talked all about these methods already today. Um, so we have two interim practice standards, one for the basin or trench and one for the on-farm recharge. And the main difference between those two is one is happening on actively farmed land and the other is happening on a dedicated space that is not farmed. Our recharge pilot program, um, again, our goal is to field test these interim practice standards. Uh, we had about 1.4 million in uh, projects uh, contracted for fiscal year 2022 in a limited area, which I just showed you on that map. Um, and we had uh, many of those projects working this winter, um, as Gordial uh, mentioned, uh, he was one of our, he outed himself, so I guess I can talk about him. He, uh, he was uh, one of our participants in the pilot program. And we did have some additional requirements on those that uh, unusual for EQIP uh, participants. We asked them if we could use a, a well near the field for monitoring. And we also worked within those irrigation district boundaries so that we had an assured water source uh, coming in. We had about 20 projects. Um, here's a bit of an overview. We also funded um, auxiliary practices to go with the groundwater recharge practices where they were needed um, to bring water to the site or to control the water. So for on-farm recharge, um, we reviewed nutrient and pesticide uh, management plans uh, with the growers to try to protect water quality. Um, we came up with a field setup plan um, to make sure that the water was gonna go where we wanted it to and that the water was going to be, um, you know, not going off-site and having off-site effects. Um, and we considered those flood impacts to the crops and the cultural practices that needed to go on, all of these things uh, that Rogel uh, detailed earlier. Um, and we required that they put water on at least once in, the, in a year. We had three-year contracts, so we had some flexibility just in case we got some dry years again. Uh, we got lucky this year, and we definitely have plenty of water. 
For basins, again, we reviewed the site history. We excluded any uh, sites that had been manure storage or other sort of obvious places where there might be contaminant contaminant problems, uh, making sure they had the, the water rights or had deliveries coming from a district. We're only working in cropland, uh, not in pasture and range, and that's consistent with uh, the governor's executive order that just came out. They are also focusing on uh, cropland areas, not uh, grazed areas. And, and we helped uh, come up with designs for the basins and trenches. So our engineering staff in-house uh, helped do those designs. We have reopened our sign up period for fiscal 2023. Um, if you have growers who are in those areas uh, who would be eligible to participate in the pilot, um, we're looking for those applications um, by April 3rd. Um, and then just in closing, I wanna say NRCS has a whole library of conservation practices. We're trying to add these groundwater recharge practices to that library, but we already are doing uh, a lot of things that could be, um, could be geared towards these multi-benefit uh, outcomes. So, you know, constructed wetlands, um, sediment basins, um, just doing cover crops and um, water efficiency for in-lieu recharge. Um, when we do the conservation planning, we're really looking at what's best for that site, what's going to achieve the outcomes. And so if you have a site that's not really good for on-farm recharge, maybe you have clay soils, that kind of thing, what are some other things that you could potentially do to achieve that um, achieve that outcome. So um, that's it. I know we're short on time, so I'm going to close it there and give it back to Asia for questions. Great. Thank you so much, Wendy. And for kind of tying that into the multi-benefit approach, if all the presenters could come on camera, uh, that'd be great. And um, we just have one question in the chat, though, of course, I always have questions, um, but we, we are running out of time. So I'm just I'm gonna convert the question. So because I think the answer would talk would take at least an hour, <laughs> and I think this would be um, probably for Kristen. Um, I'm converting the question a little bit, but where could someone? What what are some resources where someone could understand the steps for converting involving land purchases um, from an aggregate mine to a restored to a restored Merced River floodplain or park? So I think, you know, if, if someone has a site in mind and they want to do something, convert that land to a park or a river, floodplain, how would they go about it? Um, and what are some resources for them to understand that process? Okay, um, thank you for the question. I'll do my best. Um, well, one resource is us at American Rivers, and I'm happy to drop my uh, email address into the chat. Feel free to reach out to us, and I'm happy to just do a little bit of research and see uh, what kind of funding is available and maybe see if there's a collaboration that we can explore there. Great, thanks. So folks can reach out to Kristen directly. Thanks for that. Uh, I see a question in the chat um, to any of the, you, uh, what type of options are available for recharge on farms where soils have a lot of clay? Um, I'll just quickly answer that and then invite others to also answer. Uh, actually in our watershed studies, um, the places that actually have poor um, soil infiltration rates are actually really great for shorebird habitat. And these are, you know, migrating birds that need temporary flooded fields, you know, for a certain amount of time. And clay soils happen to be the best places to kind of park that water. Generally, they want about two to four inches of water. You know, these are short-legged creatures. And, um, you know, and it, it give, you know, you kind of put the water on there for a couple of weeks and then they kind of move on. Um, so that's what I understand if anyone else wants to uh, add to that. I would just add that there are some technologies that NRCS is not really engaging with at this time, but perhaps in the future of recharge wells, dry wells, um, and also subsurface recharge. Um, those are still... Um, a little bit experimental. I think Daniel touched on that a little bit in his presentation, but those could be options for folks uh, with clay soils, uh, clay surface soils. Great. Um, okay, so I think we're at time. Oh, someone says this is also vernal pool habitat and critical food for migrating birds. Yes. So you can think about it, the recharge way, the habitat way, and maybe the combination of both, um, which is what we're thinking about when we think of multi-benefit 
projects. Um, so I just want to uh, give big thanks to all of our presenters. You did an amazing job in conveying a lot of information in a short amount of time. <laughs> and I'm just going to give you a virtual round of applause and pass it back over to Marissa. Thank you. Thanks, Aisha. Thanks to our presenters. Um, all of you have done the impossible, which is um, keep us on track for today. I'm so impressed. And um, I'm just going to share my screen for the last time here and invite Ori to uh, give us some closing thoughts. All right, thanks, Marissa. And, and maybe not quite closing uh, thoughts, uh, but just want to share a little bit about the Floodmore Network. Um, so my name is Orit Kalman. I'm a facilitator with Sac State Consensus and Collaboration Program. And in the past few years, I had uh, the great pleasure of facilitating uh, various floodmore related uh, conversations. And I have to say, given the presentations that uh, we heard today, um, just sharing about the network is really um, um, important, especially as we heard earlier that uh, we need to continue and build awareness and bring everyone along um, to uh, recharge beyond, beyond our recharge pioneers that we heard from today. <laughs> so um, just to give you a little bit of a background, uh, back in uh, 2018, the California Department of Water Resources released a white paper exploring the use of flood mar as a source for recharging aquifers. And following that also convened a research advisory committee that um, really uh, explored um, gaps and needs and, and the questions that are needed to be addressed in, in terms of adv advancing uh, flood mar projects. And uh, the research and advisory committee looked at uh, 13 different uh, themes. Some of them uh, really align well with what Rogel um, outlined earlier, including uh, water rights, collaboration, water source and availability, thinking about uh, recharge suitability, crop suitability. So some of the things that he talked about, as well as you know what we just heard about the importance of really attending to uh, the multi-benefit aspect of uh, recharge. So based on uh, these uh, conversations and, and thinking through what is needed, a key outcome of that was uh, that there is a lot of work to do. And to do that, we really need to come together and, and work across disciplines to improve knowledge and support implementations. And that was really the beginning of the Floodmore Network. And um, in the past year and a half, we worked together to convene the network and think about how do we bring um, a lot of different perspectives? How do we build collective knowledge and use that to advance Floodmore? So a lot of work is uh, happening in the recharge world, and we want to make sure that we're sharing knowledge, that we're sharing tools, experience, lesson learned. And uh, so you'll see yeah, on this uh, next uh, slide, just kind of telling you a little bit about the Floodmore Network and all this with the hope that you will all join us. Really want to invite you to be part of it, because I think as we heard today, just being in the space where we're learning from each other allows us to um, advance our thinking and uh, really uh, move uh, move this forward. So um, the, uh, the network list um, is a collaboration among individuals and organizations. Uh, we have uh, different uh, federal, state, local agencies, uh, research, NGOs, um, Floodmar implementers, uh, landowners, GSA, conservation districts, uh, for, for those who are part of the network already. So uh, we invite you to uh, join us. Um, the environmental and ecological perspective um, has been represented as well. So really want to invite you to think about how you can bring your perspective and knowledge into it. And what we do as a network is really uh, share our experiences and expertise allow us to learn from each other, connect ideas, and hopefully support and develop partnerships and, and collaboration opportunities. Um, so um, we do that. Uh, we have several different ways that uh, you can join us. Uh, we have um, a monthly lunch mar where we very informally meet uh, and uh, have uh, 
presentations on a wide variety of topics related to Lunchmar. And actually, um, if, if you have a particular question or topic that you think would be really important to learn for, uh, about, please put it in the chat. We're always looking for ideas of what practical knowledge we need to uh, think through. We also have um, later this month, actually, I think that's next week, a network workshop. And this is really meant to be a roll up your sleeves uh, kind of workshop of if you wanna be part of how do we raise awareness and, and uh, really think through um, uh, being part of uh, the work that the network is doing please join us and we'll put all those links in the chat. And actually the best way right now to connect with us is uh, our new website that is um, up and running, floodmar.org. So please visit our um, website and on the website, we're sharing uh, resources and examples of uh, recharge opportunities and projects. So just a way to learn about what else is being done in this uh, in this field. Um, and also you can sign up to be part of the list and every few weeks we'll send emails with resources and opportunities to engage on this topic. And just really wanna invite you also that if you are doing work around it and, and you have information to share, we'd love to hear from you. And uh, I think that's about all we have time for. So um, I think uh, we, we, wanted, we had another slide in there really just wanting to ask you, given that we started this uh, workshop at nine today, asking you all to um, share your initial thoughts coming into it, what you're curious about, um, learning more about recharge. And we've heard so much about kind of a large concepts, but also detailed, um, experiences of how to, at this point, uh, three hours later, what are kind of the lingering questions that we still need to think through and, and really need to promote. Would love to hear from you uh, about that in the chat. And uh, I'm gonna turn it uh, back to you. Yeah, and um, I know that uh, everybody has other things on their calendar for today, but um... If, if anyone did have any lingering questions or things they wanted to share about what they learned today, I think um, we could take a couple of minutes here. Great, that would be terrific if we can. I just wanted to make sure I keep up with your schedule. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I'm, looking, I'm looking to see if we see any hands raised or any questions coming in. I'm not seeing anything so far. It's possible that we answered every single question that people may have had on the topic. Um, well, we have the contact information for each of the presenters that they shared, and um, you you know how to get in touch with all of them um, at this point. And uh, certainly, uh, you could get in touch with the conference organizers uh, to follow up as well. But um, I just wanna say thank you again to everybody who participated in this conversation. Um, I found it really interesting and um, stimulating conversation. And um, we are just uh, thrilled that we could be here today and wanna thank you. I'm uh, going to pass this back to Emily Smet, I believe. Is there anything you wanted to share about the upcoming sessions? Um. Not, nothing too in particular, but please uh, continue to come to all the sessions. And we have two more Ag and Watershed sessions coming up next week and the week after that. So hope to see you there.